Buenos días, bienvenidos nuevamente. Tengo el honor de presentarles a un gran mexicano, ingeniero de profesión, realizó una maestría en ingeniería en transportación, graduado en ambos niveles por la Universidad Autónoma del Estado de México. Cuenta con un doctorado en administración, la cual cursó en Aston University, Inglaterra, 2015. Tiene experiencia en investigación en proyectos como Semarnat con ACID, Evaluación económica de vulnerabilidad socioeconómica y demográfica en inundaciones en México. Colaboró como supervisor del Centro de Distribución del Laboratorio Genoma y fue asistente de docencia en posgrado en Aston University. Cuenta con un alto nivel crítico, por lo que realizó importantes artículos de investigación. Ha participado en diversas publicaciones en procedimientos de conferencia. Sus más recientes en 2017, Stock de Preposicionamiento para Desastres en México, un caso, y Gestión de Desastres en País en Desarrollo, el caso Villahermosa, México, en 2016. Obtuvo distinción en Graduate Teaching Assist Assistantship por Aston University para el estudio de doctorado, así como mención de honor en su tesis de maestría, ha logrado ganar la medalla Ignacio Manuel Altamirano, versión 2011, a nivel maestría en su ingeniería y más reciente por su gran dedicación, responsabilidad y habilidad de liderazgo, se le ha conferido como candidato a nivel nacional por el Sistema Nacional de Investigadores. Actualmente es profesor, es profesor en Operation and Supply Chain, Chain Management en Aston University. Démosle un caluroso aplauso al doctor Oscar Rodríguez que presentará el tema de una introducción a la innovación en el aprendizaje. Thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Uh, but, well, I have a good news and a bad news for you, okay? The bad news is you're stuck with me for this talk, so I'm sorry I'm a mess. The good news is you're not going to hear me talking all of the time, because you're going to be doing a lot of the work for jumping. Okay? okay? So, basically, we're going to be talking a little bit about innovation in teaching. Why? Uh, up to this point, Pavel introduced some of the initiatives that we have embedded in Aston to develop employable graduates, okay? Anna provided very good examples about social entrepreneurship, some of the programs that we can develop to support uh, students in the university, and also what kind of initiatives you can find in the UK. Prashanta gave you a glimpse of how you can be collaborating with industry, developing projects that has to do with organizations, NGOs, and uh, private companies. But all of these areas have a strong underpinning that is in teaching, okay? We are a new university, okay? And to be able to come, uh, come up with some innovation, as we were discussing before, and to start uh, being entrepreneurs, first, we need to grasp knowledge. We need to be able to give our students the skill set needed to become these entrepreneurs and to become employable graduates, okay? So what I'm going to do here today is to talk to you a little bit about some of the initiatives we're taking at Aston to improve our teaching. Part of it has to do with technology, part of it has to do with the approach we're taking. So, first of all, well, you don't want to hear too much about Aston anymore, but uh, teaching is very important for us. As you can see, uh, for instance, every person that you have seen in this workshop has teaching responsibility, research responsibility, and also engagement with industry, okay? We have to be working on those three pillars. Now, uh, teaching is, well, we're very proud about teaching at Aston because uh, our teachers usually get close to students and try to introduce new ways to improve the session. So that is the reason in the teaching excellence framework uh, that was an exercise performed by the UK government, we got the distinction of gold, which means that we are some of the, well, one of the best universities teaching in the UK, 
also were very good at boosting the salary of our graduates. In some cases, uh, getting more money than people from Cambridge or, or Oxford. So that has to do a lot with our approach. We have won different awards about the MBA. We are very good about trying to get our uh, graduates a job, a job before six months after the after the degree and we have very good feedback from our students okay and this feedback is very important as you're going to see in a second now today we're going to have some ground rules okay let's start with something simple some of you if you are teacher lecturers usually see the smartphones as a big problem right uh, a lot of times because people is going to get distracted or they are going to be just watching a video, chatting, whatever. Now, the rules today is that the phones are going to be an important part of, of what we are going to be doing. Okay? So please have your phone uh, close by and try to connect to the internet. We are going to need it. First thing. Now, the second one. It is very important that we understand that this kind of initiative is about learning from each other. All right? I'm going to be talking about some of the initiatives we're taking at Aston. But if you have something new, something interesting for you, we also want to hear about it. Okay? So we're going to use a little tool called Padlet. So what I'm going to be doing with this is either you can go to this URL, you can scan this code, whatever is easier for you. Hopefully the code still works. So, once you have done that, everyone up to this point? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Sorry because my name is a little bit long. And that is going to be a problem today, you're going to see why. Morpheus law, there's always something wrong. Yeah. There's a link to something called Teaching Ideas, and then that is a wall. Basically, there are going to be three categories in there, if you look at your phone. Uh, what you want to learn from here, what could be interesting for you, or if you want to share something else, all right? So, let me just see if I can... You're going to be able to see something like this, okay? Now, in here, you can comment, you can mention something, okay? And the purpose is that through this whole presentation, you can share your ideas with me, okay? Anything that is interesting to you, anything that you feel uh, should be elaborated on, and so on and so forth. And hopefully at the end, we're going to check this wall and see some ideas, all right? So that is the first part of today. Now let's go back to the presentation. And let's start with something simple. Uh, this classroom is very good because we have what? 60 people, 80 people, right? Now, that is brilliant. Interaction can be made easy in this type of classroom. Now, what happens when you have something like this? Something like what we experienced yesterday in the theater. And that is a big challenge. I can tell you, I teach a module called Principles of Operations Management. So last year I had 947 students. So that was two groups 
of over 470 students each, right? So, if I have 20 students at Masters, I can ask four of them questions. That means that I have an idea about 25% of the group. If I ask four people in a group of nearly 500, I'm not reaching even 1%, right? So, how can we make this interactive? The teaching in the UK is student-centric. So we're trying to find approaches that are going to help you enhance uh, the understanding. So, that is the reason we have to be exploring new ways. So, what I want to do now is to get an idea about you. Okay? So, again, sorry about the name. Try to go to this URL so you can answer some questions for me, okay? It's p-o-l-l-e-v.com slash o-s-c-a-r-r-o-d-r-i-g-u-134. Okay, so we have one, two, good. Some people is being able to get in. Okay, who's from the ocean? <laughs> Really, that was just. It's difficult to remember. Uh -huh. Could be, yeah. After you click on wherever you're from, you're going to have to wait a little for the next one, but I'll tell you about that. Okay, so most of you already did that. Now, the point of this, first of all, was to notice we have a lot of people from this region, the region Bajio, that is what we're trying to support somehow, but also we have a good spread of people from other places. All right? Now, this graphical tool is just an example, an icebreaker. Now imagine this if you are teaching chemistry, for instance, then you want to show different <coughs> setups of, of molecules. Or imagine this if you are teaching supply chain, then you want to see if students can get if uh, there's a link between different parts. So, this particular tool is useful because you can put a picture of whatever you want and get them or ask them a question about it, okay? So you can get them to, uh, well, you can try their understanding of certain topics, okay? So this is the first. Now let's try something different. Some of you are teachers, right? Some of you are students. For the teachers, please tell me what you teach. For students, what is your favorite subject? Okay? Uh, no, you can, in the same page, the same URL you were, you were before, is going to appear this question. So you can see here, we have a lot of people with interest in entrepreneurship. Okay. Gastronomy, yeah, marketing, innovation. So this is a creating a word cloud with all of your answers. 
So this way, I can get an, an idea about your interests and try to focus what I'm going to be talking about to those particular areas, okay? Research, photography, business. So all of that is something you can do with these type of tools. Now, let's try something different. Let's think about why you are here, right? Other than someone told you to come. If someone did, yeah, this might be the best option for you. Otherwise, tell me, what are you interested in, okay? What would you like to know about from teaching in the UK? It's pretty interesting. Fortunately, people is interested in technology, or used to be. <laughs> now it's information sources for technology supported teaching, good. We can be we can see web-based tools for interactive sessions, perfect. Because we're going to be talking about all of these topics today, right? But, really? <laughs> well, I'm flattered, you could be doing something else. So, it's a troll. Yeah? It's a troll. <laughs> okay. I'm also, well, some of you also want to know about business things. So, you can use this with your students. I didn't restrict it in any way, could have, but I didn't. Uh, but, what you can do with this is try to get a feeling about their interests, if they are understanding something or not understanding some, uh, something, and how to focus your talk, all right? Most of you as teachers know that you know way more than you tell your students. So usually, you can be balancing out a little bit of what is needed and what is required. But, let's get uh, this moving. So, yeah, we're going to talk a lot about web-based tools for interactive sessions. Fortunately, this is not winning at this point. We'll see in a second. Okay, now, in Aston we have a practical approach. We started doing that by having real cases. I, mean, I was listening to Maria yesterday, and you have something similar, because something that one of our lecturers was doing was saying, okay, we need to get people in practice. So what they did was to connect with organizations, get students there, get their insights, uh, their problems, and then the students had to provide a solution for the problem as final project, okay? So you can see that real cases is something that is very important, and those solutions were implemented in the companies. It was not just at the theoretical level. So, their performance during this exercise was uh, the basis for the mark. Now, also in data, ma uh, data mining, it's easier to use the news, whatever you want, from the New York uh, Post, or, sorry, the Washington Post, New York Times, and so on and so forth. You just give a piece to students, and they can practice. So using current knowledge is also good. Something that Pavel started implementing in Aston was something as simple as the scratch cards. So you have a set of cards that you can buy, give it to your students, and ask them questions. So they can scratch the answer to see if they got the right one, or if not, they can keep trying until they do. So this way is a way of for a formative assessment, all right? Or summative assessment. Now that we have technology, what about podcasts, okay? Instead of just giving me a report, you can talk about whatever your topic is, and we can evaluate that, and consider that a big part of your mark. Now, simulation, I'm guessing all of you, well, some of you have done this, basically is using some kind of software, so you can analyze a project, you create a model, and you analyze it. So we do that in discrete simulation, uh, and you can do it as well if you're talking about uh, transportation, for instance. I come from uh, transportation engineering. But let's move to something a little bit different, right? All of that you have seen before. Now, uh, talking about that practical approach, let's try something different. First of all, how many of you introduce your your lecture 
you, how, how many of you introduce your lecture or to your students the first time live? Most of you, right? But with the tools that we have today, why not to do it remotely? So why not to post a video on Blackboard? Okay, good morning. My name's Chris Owen. I'm a teaching fellow in the Operations and Information Management Group here at Aston Business School. And I teach a very exciting and fun module in the final year called Effective Management Consultancy. So, what we're trying to do with this module is to equip students with practical skills that will let, allow them to go out into business and organisations and tackle complex, challenging problems. And those are the sorts of problems that graduates will face in today's world. And so what we're looking at is we're looking at the, the theory and also some of the practical skills that you need to pull together in order to tackle these problems. Now I spent seven years of my life working for PricewaterhouseCoopers in their global consulting division, working all over the world, in China, in America, in Europe, uh, working on these kinds of projects. So I bring that knowledge and that experience into the classroom. Um, so the module is a very practical um, set of ideas. We don't just pull from academia, but we do pull from academia, we pull some theory, but we also look at the practical real-world uh, challenges. Uh, one of the most fun aspects of this module is in the second term, uh, students are put into groups and they take part in something called the Apprentice Challenge, where they have to raise as much money as they can in a 24-hour period for charity. And every year we have all kinds of exciting and interesting ideas. Uh, students are given a £50 uh, seed funding and they have to turn that £50 into as much money as they possibly can. And every year we raise uh, well over £10,000 as a, as a cohort for charity. Um, so I hope you decide to come on the course and I hope you decide to take this module. So, you can see that in a couple of minutes, Chris was able to summarize his module and give a glimpse to students. Now, this module is one of my favorites because it is about that practical approach. So what he was describing is a challenge that students have. Basically, they have to use their knowledge of project management and their knowledge about soft systems in complex methodologies to, sorry, methodologies to solve complex problems, and they have to organize an event, basically. So for instance, one event last year was this upsell for soy. So students gather in groups, and they get 50 pounds, and the challenge is pick up one charity and make as, as much money as you can for them, all right? So they have to organize these events. Usually you get pre-normal events, okay? Kind of uh, uh, just uh, bringing food shops into, uh, into the university so they can buy food and the owners of these little businesses are going to give a percentage towards, uh, towards, the, uh, towards the charity. But sometimes you, have, you get something that is innovative, like this. And I can say it was innovative because look at how, at how much money they raised. This was one day, okay? Over one day, they got what you would say is over 120, well, nearly 130,000 pesos, okay? So, you can see here how it is about solving the problems because this wasn't easy. It was a set of challenges because of the permits, because of the owners of the buildings, they needed to track down, they needed to contact, get agreements, and the advertising, and all of that. That is the way we get students to understand a little bit more and start being creative, and start being innovative, okay? So this module has been very successful at Aston. Something different, it has to do with the business game. I'm going to describe the business game later. But 
At this point, we have some funds within the university to develop innovative ideas for teaching. One of them, a very good colleague, is developing something that is escape rooms. Do you know what escape rooms are? Well, basically, uh, in the United States and in the UK, it's very normal for people to look for leisure activities inside. Okay? Now, one of them, yeah, it's true. So, one of them is saying, okay, do you want to have a little bit of uh, mental exercise? Let's go into a escape room. That is, is usually a room full of clues about solving something. Let's say solving a murder. All right? So, inside that room, you're going to find the clues, and each clue is going to take you to the next, until you get the final clue, solve the mystery, and then you're allowed to leave. Right? That is the concept. A lot of people do that for leisure, but uh, this colleague is going to be implementing that to improve the way students understand <coughs> the content of his module. So, it's something that is going to be uh, complicated, but it's an uh, innovation that is going to have uh, a lot of implications and is being supported with 20,000 pounds by the university. So that is another kind of idea that you can be doing. Uh, Anna already talked about Pipe. I'm not going to go too much into that. But they were very successful because of collaborative teaching. So how? Uh, some of you are from engineering. That's what I understand. When you're an engineer, you're thinking about solving problems, right? Trying to come up with something. Now, go one step further. How do you get a real enterprise going? And you're going to find out that you have a limited knowledge, a limited part of it. But there's going to be people that is going to have a different skill set. So in this exercise, what they did was to combine people from engineering, mechanical engineering, if I'm not mistaken, with people from law. Why people from law? Because they know about patents. Okay? And that is relevant because they help the engineers to develop the framework so their idea would be uh, something they could exploit. Okay? Something that would be valuable out there and something they could use to start an enterprise. Okay? Now, the use of technology in this type of teaching is something that we consider very important. It comes from something called the Higher Education Academy. So, if you want to be a teacher in the UK, it's not just about saying, I have a degree. Usually, you have to start looking at certifications. You have to show that you have the knowledge on certain areas. So, this Higher Education Academy is recognized all over the UK and they are going to have different levels. So you become a member and they are going to certify that you have the knowledge depending on the level that you are on. So for instance, Associate Fellow is someone that has undertaken a course for around four months, has the basic knowledge and basic understanding. But what we're trying to do in the UK now, at least at Aston, is having most, sorry, all of our lecturers or people doing teaching being fellows of this academy. To do that, you have to demonstrate abilities in different levels. And that is based on this standard framework from the UK BSF. So, what you need to know is you need the areas of activity that has to do a lot with the way you approach uh, your teaching. You're going to have the core knowledge that has to do with what you know, of course. And you're going to have professional values. So are you considering equ uh, equality? Are you considering opportunities for different kind of learners? All right? Are you considering that every one of you is going to learn in a different way? Some of you reading, some of you watching, some of you doing, right? So what we have to do to become fellows is to show understanding of all of these areas. Each one of them, there are five areas of activity, six uh, of core knowledge, and four of professional values. Once you have done that, you are good enough, well no, you all deserve the level of fellow, and you can teach in any university in the UK, okay? 
Now, within those dimensions, K4, which is the fourth level of core knowledge, is related to the use of technology. And that is the reason we are incentivized to use technology in our teaching. Because they say, you know what? It's an inherent part of our pedagogical planning process. Okay? Why is that? Because this is not true, is it? You can see that a lot of young people know how to handle a tablet better than, well, me. So, if we have that opportunity, why not to use it? Why not to try to engage our people using what they know and what they like? So, that is the reason technology is becoming very important in the UK. And, well, you can start that by implementing some online activities. Uh, online activities, you know it in Blackboard. So, you can have uh, some, let's say, well, some normal activities during the lecture, but you can go outside the lecture and try something different, something to try to enhance your understanding. So, this is just an example of one of the online activities, but you can use online questionnaires. So, for instance, uh, for my first year students, what I do if I want to teach them sustainability, Everybody knows Levi's, right? So they can go into that link and you need to ask them about 10 questions. Okay? You can try it in your own time if you want. And it's going to tell you how sustainable you are washing your jeans. Something as simple, but it's going to help them understand the impact in the environment of everything we do. Right? And for instance, if I want them to understand what are the bases of managing conflicts in teams. I just give them that questionnaire, they do it online, they get an answer, and I can profile them into one of the different classes. And it's easier for them to grasp, okay? And of course, videos. You have YouTube, and there are a lot of different resources there. So, for instance, talking about corporate social responsibility, the four Pinto case was very important because it was a trade-off that Ford made between the human life and basically money, okay? And they decided that money was more important, arguable or not, but you, have a, you can have a set of discussions after students are watching the video. So, I'm just putting here three different sources that we're using, depending on what you want to do. The cases can be three minutes, five minutes, but it's going to give them enough information is going to be easier to do than just reading five pages of a case, all right? Now, if you want to know a little bit more about this, I think the slides are going to be available later. Yeah? So, I'm leaving here a link because there are some studies about how to use technology and there are some courses. The MOOCs are online courses, a lot of them free, that you can take. So go into this, uh, into this link and you can learn a little bit more about how to use it. Right? Now, talking about the interactive tools, if you remember I showed you with some uh, problems the how call everywhere works. So the question about where are you from, what do you teach, all of that was in a platform called Call Everywhere. Right? The importance of that one is it, it can be embedded in the slides, so I don't have to uh, close the slides to uh, use the platform. Also, you can use the graphical tool I was telling you about. That is, in my personal perspective, a very good innovation, uh, at least the way I have used it. But there are other options out there. What I want to show you is another two that are quite popular. Uh, the shortcoming of Paul Everywhere, basically, is the cost. If you have up to 50 students, then it's great. Okay, it's free. After that, it's around $350, which can be a lot if we consider the resources we have. So, I'm going to show you Kahoot, that is a free tool, and it's quite interesting because the difference is, whereas in Paul Everywhere you are gathering information, in Kahoot, you are using that information to make students compete with each other. 
Okay? And that can be fun for a lot of them. Sumperative also has a free version and a premium version. The premium version is $50, so it's not that much. Uh, but it's going to allow you to introduce some questions that are longer in length and different op uh, and more options. So for instance, Kahoot, you struggle because you only have four answers. In Socrative, you can introduce five, six, seven, eight, whatever number you want. So, but we're going to see how they work in a second. Now, I told you I was not going to be talking the whole day. I know you're thankful for that. So, let's try something different. Let's try to play a little bit, right? What you're going to be doing is see how you work in teams, because these teams are going to be relevant for two activities. But, first of all, let's break the ice. Let's see how good you are working in teams. So, please team up with another uh, three people. So, teams of four, whatever way you want it. Okay, you can do it now. I'm joining in the one of you is going to have the option to uh, choose an answer from uh, sorry from four different answers to see which one of you is the quickest and more accurate okay now first of all I need to I need that each team has a candidate a representative okay please do that for me who is the representative <laughs> someone that is very good with technology and someone that is very quick because trust me I have seen that the speed is essential if you want to read okay ready all right the chosen one is going to be the only one with a tablet smartphone laptop whatever you want okay he's a representative of the team he's the same okay Sorry, it was the chosen one just because I know all of you want to participate. All right, ready? Now, try to go to this link. Yeah. Yeah, just a second. There you have a pin.
Sorry? Okay, which name is yours? Okay, that's it. So everybody ready? No? Okay guys, ready? Let's see which team is the best, okay? Who's the DJ's 
from 0 to 9 in A to cell order. So 0 starts with Z, 1 with O, 2 with T, so put them in order. Oh, 
So, <laughs> excellent work, maybe yes. Now tell me, what do you think? Were you engaged with activity? What do you think? I can show you the pictures. I have pictures of all of you. Figuring out that. But this was an ice-breaking activity. But you can use it nearly with anything you want. And students love to compete. Although you really should have won this one. Okay? We'll see the next one. Now, everyone okay with this? So Kahoot is a good option. The problem is the limited number of characters in the answers. Okay? But if you can put your questions and try to bound it with four answers, it's a very good tool and it's very engaging, even with the music and everything. Okay? Now, let me ask you something. Talking about how you, well you work in groups. Did you have anyone like this? The three pillars of our pyramid are communication, integrity, and teamwork. Question, since when do pyramids have pillars? Answer, shut up. Problem, all of my team members are idiots. If I communicate <laughs> my honest opinion of their ideas, I will be a team player. But if I pretend to agree with their bad ideas, I won't have integrity. So instead of being a pyramid, can I be a two-legged stool like you? Wow, that was much better than my pillar questions. Aren't you my other team? <laughs> so tell me, did you find that? Yes? Who? <laughs> well, it would be interesting to know. Okay. Hopefully, you were good at working in teams. And that is going to be important because what I wanted with that activity is for you to get comfortable with each other because we're going to do another activity that is where way more challenging, okay? Now, before I do that, I'm going to talk to you about business games. Business games is a very good and practical way. We get students thinking about a lot of the challenges in the business uh, industry. So there are different types of simulators that we use for that. Uh, we have a business strategy game that is for short workshops. The business game that runs over a whole uh, year, actually, two terms in the supply chain game that we have over the second term in supply chain management. Okay? Like this, you can find way more. There's one for project management, there's another one uh, if you want to know about consultancy and so on and so forth. Now, just to tell you a little bit about the business game. Uh, focusing on the business strategy game, that is the one I run in a, well, I facilitated in a workshop, Basically, what you have to do is to create a work plan and students are going to get a company, okay? They get the company with some money and a lot of decisions to make. The decisions can be any of the ones that you can see in the slides. So, this is very thorough because it's going to be considering uh, knowledge and operations. It's going to be considering knowledge of marketing. It's going to be considering knowledge of finance and so on and so forth. So they have uh, a lot of different decisions. I think over, if I'm not mistaken, it should be over 80 decisions they have to make. So you can easily differentiate among teams because they should have a clear strategy for this to work. Now, this was done over one week and it's relevant because on one side you are giving, giving them that practical kind of approach and on the other, remember how much you wanted to win in the previous activity? Something similar happens because they compete with each other. And the interesting thing is they don't only compete with the people inside their classroom. In this type of game, uh, we were very proud because when we ran it, 
our team was one of the top 10 in the world in terms of the score. So it was very good, their performance. I cannot say anything for the mentoring, but their performance was very good. So, this type of game gives them insight about how it would be to have a company. Why is it good? Because Anna was talking about something very important. When you're talking about enterprises or companies, what you want is to succeed, right? But what happens when you don't succeed? You cannot, you cannot afford that in a real company. But with something like this, they can learn from their mistakes and evolve for the future, okay? Now, uh, that takes me to the supply chain game. That is a different kind of approach. The supply chain game is saying, okay, instead of looking at all of the areas, let's just think about a particular area that is supply chain. So you have a phone industry, so you are shipping foam to different areas. You are going to have to decide how much to ship, when, where, and so on, okay? So the number of decisions, uh, well, you have fewer decisions, but still they have to consider marketing, for, oh, sorry, uh, the market analysis. So they have this, well, to run it at the beginning, what you're going to do is to run only with one region, okay? Get them acquainted with the game so they can fail. Now, in this, something that is interesting to see is that usually you have eight teams. One of them is a computer. The computer is not going to do anything. So it's going to have exactly the same policy as the rest of the teams at the beginning. So you can see if your students improved or worsened the performance of the company. You might laugh, but usually you have what? One, two teams that perform uh, worse than the computer with a uh, policy that is far from optimal, okay? So in this case, once you do that, uh, what happens is during seven days, the game is running. They have to make the decisions based on the strategy, but during those seven uh, days, they can wake up at 3 a.m. and change something, or 5 a.m., or whatever they want to do. So it's non-stop for a week. Uh, from our experience, students get very, very excited. And students get very, very impatient. Because if their strategy is not working, they tend to make the mistake of making rush decisions and, well, ruining everything. But again, it's good because that way you learn from your mistakes. Uh, now, what I'm going to be doing now is saying, okay, we don't have the time to run in any, of, any of these games, okay? Uh, beyond the licenses, you need, what? I would say at least a week to run this game properly. But we can try a small activity with another kind of simulator. simulator. So that's what we're going to be doing here. You have your teams, right? You know each other. Now, we're going to play a free version of the supply chain game. But this free version is open code. So that means that you can use it with as many students you, uh, as you want, whenever you want. And you can find this type of applications in the web, okay? So now, let me just explain briefly this game. There are going to be four stakeholders. So imagine any industry. You are going to have a factory. You are going to have a wholesaler that is going to be, uh, sorry, a distributor that is going to be buying for, uh, from the factory and distributing to different wholesalers. Then you have the wholesaler that is going to be the supplier of the final retailers. Okay? This is a very simplistic supply chain, I have to tell you. But it's easy to grasp, right? So each one of these is going to be a supplier and a client of another. Now, what you have to do is just think about choosing one, which one you want to be. In your team, each one of you is going to be one of these entities, okay? So you have to decide which one you are going to be running. Now, 
ground rules. It's going to take two weeks, so uh, you can deliver your product. If you have inventory, you're going to serve the order. If not, you're going to serve it on the following period. Okay? So you're going to have what we call a backlog. Is it enough? Yeah? Now, each unit is going to cost five euros, but if you have backlog, that is going to be worth 25 euros. So producing each unit is not as expensive as the money you lose if you don't have enough inventory. This happens a lot uh, because if you lose the customer, they might go for uh, the competition, they might not come back to you. And the objective is quite simple, minimize cost. Okay? If you minimize cost, you're able to maximize profit. All right? Easy peasy? Okay. Now, this is the interface of the game. So it's very simple. You're going to have a number of items that are being requested by your client. In this case, it's going to be someone from your group. Now, the number of stock you have in your warehouse, how many items you have stored, also how many items you are shipping to the client, right? And here, you're going to be deciding how many items you are going to request from your supplier. Again, someone from your group, okay? This is the number you're going to be changing. So in this version, you could say simplistic, because the point is only making an order, deciding how much to ask from your supplier. Okay? <coughs> Easy enough. You have the backlog here, how much you owe your client, and finally, how many items you are receiving from your customer. All right? So, any questions with this? Can you repeat what the backlog is? Oh, the backlog is if you don't have enough inventory, the order is going to stay there and you have to fulfill it in a following period. Okay? It's, let's say, kind of a negative value of the difference between the demand and what you can supply. Exactly. Any other questions? No? Don't worry, you're going to get many in a second. So, these are the instructions. First of all, each framer is going to need their device, you see? And you're going to go into this URL. Now, let me just say, remember the representative that was in charge of answering the questions in the previous section? Yeah? That representative is the first one to go in because that person is going to be the one to create the game for your team. Okay? So let's start only with one person.
Okay, guys. Sorry. Everyone is ready. So, what I want to do is to. You have remember one place in which you can put your wallet, right? The one with the envelope. Okay. Now, the first time you can put whatever number you want, depending on the stock that you have. And once you do that, once the four of you or the three of you do that, the game is going to run, and you're going to get the request from your client, from your customer. Okay? And you can keep introducing how much you want to request from your supplier, and so on and so on. So what we're going to do now is put a number in the part with the envelope, in that section, all of you. By the way, no talking among yourselves. So you're independent, you're different companies, okay? So you cannot share any information. The game is going to be charging until all of the members of the team put the number, okay? Put their order. And then, once the four of you have introduced the number, it is going to move on and you're going to get a request from your customer, okay? And you can request again from your supplier, okay? So the purpose here is to avoid having stockouts. Okay? So now keep on going, iterating one once and again until you finish with the 30 repetitions. Okay. Because of time, I'm going to have to cut this down. But this is a reason because in this type of game, what you need is different moderators, facilitators, that are going to be going from one group to another. As you can see, Pablo was helping me out with that. But usually, if you want to have good response, you need one person for every three teams, four tasks. Okay? So that's one of the things you notice. Another thing, hopefully, that you notice is that it takes a while to grasp the basic, basic rules, but once you do it, is quicker, right? Now, in this case, uh, what you could have picked up if you would have finished the 30 uh, turns would be something like this, and something like this. If you don't communicate with each other, most likely a small change in the demand of the retailer is going to mean uh, a big change in the demand of the manufacturer. So that is the reason I use this particular app to teach what we call the Woodwave effect. Okay? How if you don't communicate with each other, then uh, the, everyone is going to be thinking on their own interests and trying to be safe. <laughs> now, the other part of that game is basically saying, this was independent thinking. So each one of you was acting as an independent entity. What happens if all of you communicate and have perfect information? Hopefully, all of that reduces. Okay? So that is the rest of the activity. But because of time, we're not going to go through that. Okay? But you identify some of the challenges of trying to implement these games. So that is the reason we try to have, first of all, a practice session so students can get acquainted with it. And also, we try to have enough people to have the facilitation of the game. It's very good because it's very practical, it's easy to, it's easy to understand at the end the concepts that you require in terms of theory, but it takes a while and you need to set, up, set it up properly. 
Okay, and you need very good internet connection, which was a small problem here. Now, I, we're not going to do much of this because of because you couldn't finish the activity. But Socrative is the last tool I was going to talk to you uh, today. And basically, well, why not? Can you go into this URL, please? It's going to take less than a couple of minutes. Enjoy this room. Yeah, and then bring it together. Yeah. If you have the space, okay. it's a very good idea. Or you want online? You can do it online. The problem is at the end you want them to communicate eventually. So unless you have the tool for that, uh, it becomes a challenge. Okay, everybody in Socrative? Right? Yeah? Okay. Yeah? Everyone in? Okay. We're waiting here. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, move on with that. Okay, so 16 out of the 40 students have answered the question. So basically, in this type of tool, what you can do is what we call teacher paste. So I can ask you a question and explain something. It can have something to do with theory, it might be because of the concepts. So after the exercise, what I do is to say, okay, were you able to reduce costs, for, uh, for instance? Most of you uh, should give me an answer, either yes or no. We're going to check the results and see why that happened that way, okay? In most cases, you cannot answer this question properly because you should have done the two exercises. But in most cases, I would get an answer from students saying, yes, we improved the system when we started talking to each other. So that is the basic concept that you need in companies. It might be trivial and evident, but in a lot of companies, it happens otherwise, okay? They take care of their own interests. So, I can go step by step. You can see that now in your device, you have the second question. So the teacher pace kind of mode allows me to control the pace of the questions, of everything we are doing. So at the end, I can see the results that we're getting from the activity, okay?
So that is the second question. The third question, in case you want to answer it, and that's it. So you can see that Socrates, again, good uh, to try to collect data, very good to try to explain concepts, even to give the answers to students. Uh, and if you have up to 50 students, again, there's a free version, so it's better. If you have more, you can buy the $59 version, that is a premium, and it's going to allow you to have more students in different rooms. Okay? So, the last bit of it, let's see if anyone wrote anything on Padlet. Okay. So, what you can do here is take the comments from your students and try to summarize what you have been talking about during the session, okay? If there's something that wasn't understood, you can use this to see it, identify it, and try to improve it in the final part of the session. Otherwise, you can use some of the comments to improve your teaching for the next session, okay? Unfortunately, it seems like we have pretty good ideas here, although I don't know why it's happening. But, basically, we can see that some of you were okay with what we were using, and they... Is this another one? I need to expand this one. So... Sorry about that. So basically, you take those ideas and use them to improve your teaching, okay? Sorry for the problems in technology, talking about technology, but any question that you have? No? Kind of happy? Sorry for all the trouble. Thank you very much for attending, attending this session, and I'm available if you have any questions later on. Thank you very much.